Hi guys, in this video we're going to be looking at time series data and we're going to try to forecast time series data into the future using a classical multiplicative model. This is an example of a decomposition model because it's going to aim to decompose the time series and since we're looking at the data let's also use the data here. This is our time series data. It consists of one numerical variable that's measured in time. In this particular example, we've measured the data quarterly. So the periodic recording of the data was done once a quarter, presumably at the end of the quarter. And uh, pop, this could be something like uh, sales or um, volume or something like this. Okay, but uh, of course, this can be applied to any type of numerical variable that's measured in time at uh, periodic um, moments. In other words, if it's quarterly data, monthly data, weekly data, semi-annual data, daily data, uh, hourly data, depend on, depending on what kind of field you're applying this to, um, you might have much more granular or much less, much more broad kind of time frames that you're looking at. So in this particular example, we're looking at quarterly data. So our first time series value is 4.8. And I, we don't know what this is. This could be dollars. This could be thousands of dollars. This could be millions of dollars. This could be, uh, this could be a number of things. We don't really care. It's a numerical variable. That's what we're interested in. So we, uh, f the first time series value that we have uh, recorded is for the year 2011, quarter one. So that's January, February, March. At the end of March, uh, we recorded something, and that was 4.8. <clears throat> OK, and then we, we continued this next quarter, so three more months pass, and we record uh, or measure this, this time series value again and on and on and on until we get to the next year and we start again quarter one two three four and obviously as you can see here we have four years of quarterly data so that that's a decent amount of data to work with uh, to do this introductory example with but uh, uh, sometimes you might have less data luckily uh, hopefully I should say you have more data uh, the more data you have to work with the more um, you can pick up on uh, patterns, uh, so always more data is the better. But uh, with forecasting, having having four years is is nice. Okay, sometimes too much is is not good either because you don't want to go too far back. Uh, sometimes when you're forecasting, um, again it depends on the scenario and the application. So let's jump into this a little bit more. So. Uh, just because the data is presented like this, don't take it for granted that time series just looks like this. Uh, it could be you could just get this one column and then some information about um, how the time how the time series was recorded, or like in other words, like these two columns, or it could just tell you that here's the time series and you're not really uh, you're kind of left in the dark. You don't really know. Uh, what month, year, quarter these numbers came from. Only thing you know is that they're sequential. In other words, 4.8 came first, then 4.1, and on and on and on, and 8.4 it was the last um, time series value. So in this case, luckily, we have a little context. We have a little time kind of context, so we could relate to this a little more. Um, so, so let's jump in a little more. Um, let's first thing I would do is kind of get my data to to be in this format, kind of uh, as organized as I can make it. And I would love to first get a visual on the time series. Uh, in other words, make a plot. So a plot will reveal a lot of things to me that I can't really see just staring at this. Okay. So um, again, Google Sheets. A little um, unsophisticated with its plots but it's gonna give us the bare bones of what we want to see and so I just want to basically see this plotted I would love to have um, to play around with the axes and make sure that the time 
is perfectly placed on the axis but I'm gonna I'm gonna be satisfied with just seeing the time series line okay uh, uh, curve so let's insert so I'm highlighting all my data insert chart and it's gonna make a good suggestion typically when it, when you have this type of simple plot and I'm just gonna take it I'm not gonna spend too much time with the plot uh, playing around with tweaking it the only thing I'm really interested in looking at here is how this time series data uh, varies over time. Um, interesting things to pick up here are seasonality and trend. Okay, so as we could see here, it seems like every year, uh, again, it would have been nice to have a horizontal axis that had nice labels, but we're just going to leave that off. We're not going to make this about creating a plot. Roughly speaking, quarterly data we see here that every four periods this kind of thing happens and if you're very careful you'll if you look at the data you'll see that quarter four in every year tends to be the peak of that season of that seasonality uh, that, that I'm talking about Okay, so seasonality is like a repeating pattern that uh, repeats itself, in other words, every year. It, it, it repeats within a year, okay, because we have something else that uh, is very similar called cyclicality. And cyclicality is a repeating pattern or cycle that repeats beyond a year, okay, and usually many years, and it's usually tied to the larger macroeconomic business cycle. So we're not dealing with that scale of data here. With four years, you wouldn't really be able to pick up to, to some anything too interesting on cyclicality, but seasonality happens within a year. And if we look at this plot and also glance back and forth at our, at our data, we could see that the fourth quarter, one, two, three, four, so this is the 4.8, okay? Uh, sorry, it's a 6.5 here, right? And then again, one, two, three, uh, rather, probably here, 5.8, one, two, three, four. Here's the 7.4, right? And if I keep going, if you kind of connect this well, or spend a little more time, rather, making this uh, plot you'll see that quarter four is the peak of each of these cycles that I'm seeing okay it's pretty obvious these cycles so whatever it is this guy is measuring peaks in the winter kind of months at least if we're talking about the northern hemisphere here so if it's sales it might be something that people buy in the colder seasons and and it troughs or it kind of hits its bottom in the first and second quarters of every year and if you kind of look here you'll see that uh, each each of these cycles is kind of uh, at its lowest in the uh, first and second quarter <clears throat> okay especially the second in the warmer months it seems to be the lowest okay so if you see something like this this is clearly seasonality so we have something called seasonality in our time series okay and uh, the other thing to notice is kind of blur your eyes to this kind of thing we're talking about this uh, cycle this repeating pattern and look for an overall very long-term upward or downward movement in the time series that we call trend so here clearly you see whatever this is that we're measuring over time has an upward trend okay so sometimes you might have a downward trend you might have something that's on its way down uh, over time you might have something that's going up or you might have something that's just flat something that kind of doesn't change much or uh, as far as long-term movement but very well might change uh, considerably within a year so you can have season seasonality and not trend and vice versa as well okay so here we have seasonality and we have trend an upward trend so this plot gave us a feel for what to kind of uh, what what our time series 
uh, how it behaves. Okay, so we're going to take a systematic approach. Actually, the systematic approach we're going to use is called the classical multiplicative model for forecasting. And what that says in its simple form is that every time series value, so here's y, is equal to, can be decomposed into a couple components. And what are those components? That is some of the things we've been talking about. A seasonal component, okay, and we just talked about this, times a trend component, and we just talked about that, times an irregular component. And we didn't talk about this. The irregular component is hard to talk too much about. Uh, it This is the piece of the time series data that is almost beyond our, um, ex beyond what we can explain due to um, unforeseen uh, events or variations, things that we cannot uh, control for, random error, these type of things we lump up typically into something called a, an error term or an irregular term. And here we uh, include this in the model, but through the techniques that we're going to use, we're going to be able to average this guy away. and. Uh, never, never losing sight that he's he's there. The irregular component o is always there, um, but uh, we'll be able to average him away and be able to focus on these two guys. Okay. Now, these, this, what, what I'm presenting here is the classical multiplicative model. Um, this also includes what we talked about a little earlier, cyclicality. So, if I include a capital C here, you know what I mean, cyclicality. And since we're not going to deal with data that's long term enough, decades of data, uh, we're not going to be able to kind of pick up cyclicality. But I wanted you to be aware of what cyclicality is. So remember, these are repeating cycles. Here's a cycle for you. Here's another example of a cycle. Okay, there's two repeating, right? One, two. Here's here's a cycle. Okay. A cycle repeats, if, it's, if it repeats within a year, we call that seasonality. If it repeats, if it takes longer than a year to kind of go through its motion, that's cyclicality. And that has to do with fundamental differences in what's going on, what the time series is being affected by. Seasonality tends to be uh, related to the seasons. Holidays, if we're talking about sales, weather, things like this. Cyclicality, since it's much more long term, tends to be uh, movements. These up and down swings tend to be take much longer to occur because they're connected to much more longer phenomena like the business cycle, the macroeconomic business cycle, periods of prosperity perhaps, periods of recession affect businesses if we're talking about sales forecasting. So whatever business you're in, you're also going to be affected by the conditions of the overall economy, obviously. So if things are very well, you wouldn't be surprised if you looked at data for long term enough period that you would see your business uh, also booming though during those times of prosperity and then uh, bottoming out during the periods of recession or depression even. Okay, so I include S, T, I, and C, and I'm multiplying all of them because this is the classical multiplicative model. But we're in these examples that I'm going to work here, we're not going to see the cyclical component in, in action. Okay, So I want you to be aware of this. Now, the rest of what we're going to do, and we're going to essentially go to the right here on, ex on uh, Google Sheets and fill up these columns, are going to be steps in order to separate y into these components and then once they're separated I can bring them together at the very end and make forecasts slash predictions okay I call that slash predictions because I tend to try to use the word forecast for f the future for future predictions and predictions uh, could be for uh, as a more general term it could be predictions of things that have happened <coughs> already Okay, but that, that, that's kind of more subtle than we need to be. 
Okay, the ultimate goal of all this is to learn from this time series data. This is the past. This is historical data. Here is the picture of it. I want to learn from the patterns here and then take what I've learned and then project them into the future. Project that into the future to make good predictions of what's going to happen in the future where we don't know what's going to happen, right? So we can learn from the past, project into the future, and in order to do that, we want to take a structural approach. A model provides us with that structure, and the model we're going to use is an elementary one called the classical multiplicative model. Okay? So be sure to watch the follow-up videos in this series where now we're going to get our hands dirty and actually move forward and make uh, actually put put all that theory that we're talking about into practice and come up with predictions okay so be sure to watch part two and beyond